Hello and welcome back to Unheard, where we are into episode two with John Gray, philosopher, expert on the history of ideas and liberalism, columnist at the New Statesman magazine, and our guide today through the morass of moving parts that the world find itself having to contend with. We were talking just recently about the UK quagmire uh, and how the different strands of thought have all butted up against obstacles they hadn't really factored in. The hope now is that we might zoom out a bit and look at the, the wider world situation and what kind of world they now inherit. So let's start with, with Europe. Um, you Obviously there is war on the continent of Europe and that is the major uh, new factor. But even before that, we mentioned Georgia Maloney and Sweden. There are continuing movements within European politics that also don't seem to be content to just slide back to a kind of pre-2015 technocracy. What's your take on the kind of broader European politics? Well, it's a feature of the um, liberal technocratic worldview that uh, populist movements in Europe and elsewhere will fade away when they can't achieve their goals. But since the underlying discontents which they express continue to exist and in some respects even get worse, they don't fade away. So we have in uh, Italy, uh, after many years of technocratic government, not only the 18 months of uh, Mario Draghi, which came to an end just recently, but before that, many other, Renzi and many other embodiments of technology, many, many embodiments of technology have not removed populism or post-fascism or whatever it is from uh, Italian um, politics, but on the contrary, the, um, they returned to power. Uh, in Sweden also, we have a, a government which is dependent on a party which, whether or not it's fascistic, is certainly well to the right, far to, to, to the right. And in Germany, there is the opposition alternative to Germany, AFD, is a very powerful force. And rising again. And rising again now. Uh, and not to speak of France, where uh, although the right is divided in many ways, that's probably what part of one of the things that has saved the centre and the technocratic liberal project embodied in Macron in France is that the right has been so divided and hasn't had a, a really gifted um, leader capable of uh, unifying it. Um, it remains the case that uh, about 40% of the French electorate is willing to vote for um, uh, a far-right party, which includes, as the AFD does, revisionists so-called about the Second World War, Holocaust deniers. These are all there, these, these phenomena in uh, in, in um, um, European politics, and they're not going away, they keep recurring. And as I say, they keep recurring because the, the causes of them, in uh, the, the, the roots of them, don't go away. Now, on top of that, of course, now, we have um, um, uh, war on the European continent and the economic and political impact of war, which includes, uh, because the war is not only the... Um, the trench war and the uh, uh, um, encounters of uh, regular and irregular military forces on the territory of Ukraine, but also a very um, ambitious uh, and um, just to a large extent actually well-executed hybrid war that Putin is waging through his control of energy supplies into Europe and um, also secondarily of food uh, uh, exports to Europe and the world. And I think here, the most important thing perhaps to understand is that the, the business model of the largest of the EU states, Germany, has um, blown up. The business model of, um, uh, so to speak, of Germany was a kind of a cantalism using the institutions of the European Union and its dominance within the European Union as, 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 as uh, tools. Um, or instruments um, was to um, um, uh, renew German industry uh, through um, close linkages with the Chinese market and dependency on um, Russian energy. They were the two sort of big pillars of um, the political economy of the German experiment. And remember again, Germany is the uh, is the example which every um, uh, clever technocrat in Britain, every 
uh, um, liberal uh, and technocratic nostalgia. You see, they're the people. They're the grown-ups. They're the people who know how to how to how to how to live, work it well. They were uh, these these elites. Merkel was the regen, the real head of the free free world, and so well. It was Merkel and uh, the rest of the German political establishment that um, uh, um, embarked on this uh, energy policy, which has been more catastrophic for Germany than for any other any other country. And then to the energy policy of both it has two sides to it, both deep dependency on um, Russian gas, and secondly, an ill-thought-out and ill-timed um, uh, um, disinvestment from uh, um, uh, coal, nuclear, and fossil fuels. So it's the two things taken together, um, an ill-thought-out uh, um, energy policy reacting to the real threat of climate change on the one hand, nowhere more um, uh, 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 strongly adopted than in Germany, with acute dependency on um, uh, Russian energy imports. So um, these, th the whole German model, essentially, the model which every British Remainer, every British liberal technocrat said, this is what we should do, has blown up. It's not coming mm -hmm. back. How can it come back? Um, uh, so they, they thought this was a forever world. They thought it was a forever and world. And this was a sort of inevitable march towards something that looked ever more like that. It, it was fact, part, it was like as the EU was itself, but in Germany, maybe nowhere more. It was an end of history project. Um, and um, it's gone now. I mean, it could only come back if um, Xi Jinping either lost power or utterly changed again, which is not going to happen. It could only come back in relation to Russia if um, um, there was some possibility of regime change in Russia to a more liberal or at least um, more moderate uh, uh, regime, which I think there isn't that much uh, chance of. Mm. It could only come back if there was a, um, a serious um, um, prospect of some kind of settlement in Ukraine. Um, but we've gotten beyond all those possibilities now. Um, and I'm worried, actually, about um, uh, the situation in Ukraine. What you described there with the, the vulnerability of Germany, which is the powerhouse of Europe, and the whole, been, yeah. the whole sort of edifice of the European Union is built on Germany yeah. to some extent. To some extent. And I just worry, what, what does that mean for Europe then? You have someone like Giorgio Meloni, mm. who is nominally a populist, mm. nominally a right winger, etc., mm. but actually has signed up to the kind of technocratic yes. principles of yes. Italy's membership in yes. the European Union because she apparently has no alternative. Yes. So you have these populist movements that are butting up against mm. the still powerful EU edifice. What happens if that really starts to crumble? Well, I think it... I'm not saying there will be a sudden catastrophic breakdown in the EU. It's, it is a more resilient institution in some respects than many... Um, Brexiters have allowed, but the way they, the way it's viewed as a kind of rock of ages, a kind of still point in a turning world to cite, I think, T. S. Eliot, um, uh, is a complete illusion because it's deeply divided already between, um, even before uh, the Ukraine war, between um, Poland and Hungary, different from each other, but also um, not accepting, trying to push a kind of nationalist national conservatism or um, illiberal democracy within the European um, theater, not not aiming to exit from uh, the EU. Uh, These are the Eastern European The Eastern Europeans, states, the Eastern Europeans. Hungary, Poland. Uh, Hungary, Poland. Czech. Uh, uh, the Czech Republic. Um, all of those greatly at odds with both with, uh, particularly with Germany, but also with um, France on, on, on many issues. That pre-existed. Uh, there are also the only issues to do with population movements, migration. Um, but they've never pushed it to the brink um, uh, because they're dependent on European largesse in many ways. And especially if you're within the Euro, uh, um, um, or, or you're uh, as Italy is, and as other, uh, other, it's even more revolutionary. I mean, one of the reasons Brexit could be done at all in Britain was that we weren't in the Euro.
if it had involved, um, as it would for France, for example, if it had involved um, um, con shifting to a, a, a new national currency, um, the risk in France or the certainty is one of the reasons that um, uh, um, the national rally, Marine Le Pen, um, changed their policy on uh, leaving the euro. It would mean a devaluation of the uh, um, um, euro, uh, a devaluation in the, in the new currency, and lots of people would lose their savings. Same would be true in. Same would be true. So in, they're stuck. So they're, a lot of these stuck. countries. Have... Although, by the way, it doesn't. They're not necessarily forever struck because the people who would lose their savings are the ones who have savings. An interesting feature of um, older people, mostly. Uh, an interesting feature of um, uh, Eurosceptic opinion in general in Europe is that it's actually strong among young people. Mm. The notion that... Um, opposite to the UK. Opposite to the UK. And I think the reason that's actually a, an economic reason is that we're outside the, uh, uh, the Euro. So it's not, not, not the case that um, uh, European young people, the people who cling on to the European project as it was, are people in their 50s and 60s mm. and 70s. Um, uh, who have some savings, who, who are r relatively comfortable in life. The people, the people like in, in Italy, who young people who face no uh, job opportunities, very restricted one, who've had almost decades of stagnation, but they're not particularly. Um, Again, that doesn't portend very well no. to the institution of the well, European the Union. Happen, if the young people are the, the least enthusiastic. The best that can happen is that it's just dysfunctional. That it can't actually respond to any of these serious issues. That it takes too long to come up with an energy policy. That when it does come up with an energy policy, particularly particular nation states do something different or refuse to go along with it. There's been a lot of European resistance to the German energy energy, not just with regards to Russia, but the the bailouts and so on. It's all the old structural problems of the EU um, um, become more acute, and rather than breaking down in some catastrophic way. I think it could just become more and more dysfunctional and uh, different countries doing different things and just ignoring um, what, what Brussels says. Like Whether, Hungary has shown is possible. It is possible. You can get away with it for a long time. Uh, basically, the, the paper tiger in the, in the conflict between, I don't like, like the Orban regime at all, but the paper tiger there is, is the EU because they're saying, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll... So actually had no effect at all. He's kept on winning. Hmm. Uh, he's kept on um, with his uh, combination of um, illiberal democracy and populist economics. He's he's he's, he's kept on winning. And uh, similarly in Poland, the uh, 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 somewhat Eurosceptic nationalist um, Catholic right has has um, has kept on, has, has kept on winning. Well, they seem to have worked out they don't need to leave. They can still they get what they want within the. Well, they nominal. don't need to leave an enfeebled institution. They don't need, and as I say, it's, hard, it's, it's harder if they're in the Euros. Uh, so um, so you're, the, the picture you're painting is actually, again, seems precarious because you've yes. got movements of uncontent parts of the population mm. stuck within or maybe belonging to a, an institution that is becoming weaker. So mm. we get these kind of glassy, confident pronouncements from Ursula von der Leyen or from the top brass mm. with the atmosphere that everything is still okay and there's always a plan and everything's fine, but what what you seem to be saying is it, it's not really. Well, there's a comedy in this. I read a, a comment in today's paper where someone said, well, you know, at least the Europeans have got a plan, they've, the, the European Union, they've got a 60-year plan. 60 years? What sort of... <laughs> it's completely delusional. We don't know how the, um, the, uh, the Ukraine war is going to end. Um, it's said that all wars end at some point with with a settlement. It's very hard to see what the settlement would be because no. um, uh, what's become clear, I think, in um, in Ukraine is that the goals of the Russian goals extend beyond Ukraine. Certainly, it's partly about Ukraine. Um, the um, uh, late historian Norman Stone once said that without Ukraine. Russia is just thousands of miles of snow. <laughs> well, that's a, uh, but Ukraine men, means an awful lot to um, uh, to Russia as a state and uh, and, and also to um, Russia's prestige and to to its history. It's existential to them. So yeah. although they might be ready to have, might have been ready to accept some kind of um, Finlandization or neutralization with the relevant uh, uh, security guarantees, it's not clear they are now because. 
the, the, the goal of, uh, that they would be now, because the goal of um, Putin's goal there seems to be one uh, of resetting uh, the world order. Hmm. I mean, when people, when he talks about this, people think, well, it's not what he really wants, not what he really believes. And I think it is partly what he really believes in. He really wants, because in this new world order, Russia would have a larger place, a more active role than it had before. Now, it's not clear that any of this can work because it's not clear that there is a convergence of interests or visions between Russia and China, for example, or between Russia and Iran, one of their, one of their allies. Um, uh, but um, uh, his goals are clearly extend to a different settlement in Europe. And that brings us back to Europe because um, what, would be, what would be an acceptable um, settlement for Europe? Would it involve um, restarting the energy flows? Would it involve, in other words, accepting continued dependency on Russian energy? That's what it would amount to. Slowing down the transition that would otherwise have to be made by Germany in particular from a, a Russia-based energy economy. Would it involve some kind of settlement with um, um, China? Because the uh, trade links with China were, were profound. The car industry, the auto industry. I mean, I sometimes think you can, you can work out really uh, uh, um, um, German foreign policy just by looking at the, the um, demands of its car industry. It's, it's an essentially mercantile driven by driven by, by economics and also by the long-term German historical goal of coming to terms with, with, with Russia. Mm. But it hasn't worked and it's not clear how it now can work. So the idea that Europe is a, um, is a viable institution that contains the energy, uh, literal, literally energy in terms of um, um, keeping the economy going and also the intellectual is, is an illusion. And remember, the basic, the basic issue, of the basic uh, flaw apart from the structural flaws in, in, in the euro, about Europe, is that it created itself as a kind of crypto state without any means of defending itself. And that shows that it was a, an end of history project. They wouldn't need to. They wouldn't need to. I mean, that was the They relied on American security guarantees. Partly on America, but also on the fact that there wouldn't be any conflict with, um, uh, with Russia. And of course, both of that side uh, could be very different. I mean, the American side could be different after the next, next mm. election. If we get to Santos, but I've read as much as I can of what he said. He said almost nothing about Ukraine. Mm. There's no sign of deep commitment there. He's, he's also said very little about Taiwan. He said quite a bit about we should avoid being swamped by Chinese goods and so on and so forth. We don't want that, but nothing like that. It's not clear that he'd accept this by guarantee. guarantee. Not clear in either case. So what is our role or the West's mm. role in having made this situation worse? Because you've been someone who has really been quite robust about the Ukraine mm. project or, or repelling the barbarism, as you call it. Um, but it sounds from what you're saying like you you accept that it's potentially a bit more complicated than that. Mm. Um, it's, and it's not just more. You're not a. You're not with Mearsheimer. You're not. You're not a, a sort of so well, self-described the, realist. No, when it well, comes to I Ukraine. have sympathies for um, a realist. Or would be more someone like Morgenthau actually, because the the essence of. There are different strands of realist thought. There is a strand which interprets the actions of states as kind of calculations of material and interest, other kinds of interests, kind of model basically on economics, and which has a rational choice theory at the mm. back of it. And so if Putin does what he did do, they say, well, he must have had reasons for that, and the reasons must have been, and then they blame the West. They say they, uh, uh, the West broke tacit promises over Ukraine. It, it crept up too much to uh, Ukraine's uh, borders and so on. Now, there may be something in that narrative, but it's only a, a part and maybe not the main part now of what's driving uh, um, Putin. Uh, and the, uh, what's driving him is, a, is a, uh, an almost a semi-mystical vision of, of the, uh, the Russian realm, uh, as it, which would include not just Ukraine, but parts of the Baltic states, parts of Central Asia, maybe on some, even Poland. It's a kind of vast semi-mystical thing inherited from um, uh, the Tsars, uh, Tsarist Russia, which he wants to, to, to restore. And I think the error of 
Mearsheimer and others is to simplify um, um, uh, Putin's behavior by seeing it as a, uh, as a, uh, a reaction against uh, the West, simply a reaction against the West. That all would have been well if, if the West hadn't been to. But there's a deeper, a deeper flaw in it, which is that, um, that the um, uh, conception of rationality that the realists work with, which is that of states being something like rational economic agents in market theory, isn't the way states really react. Uh, states are moved, the deciding forces of states are to do with history, to do with um, uh, even emotion, to do with myth, to do with um, uh, um, factors which emerge from and are very powerful in the history of a long period. I mean, for example, in the case of Xi Jinping, um, uh, little is known about his earlier life, but it looks as if he responded to um, um, his earlier privations in, and his family's privations in the, um, mm. uh, in the Cultural Revolution um, by uh, um, saying, well, what we've got to avoid at all points is a sort of slide in, into anarchy in China because when that happened before, we've had warring states and China's been weak. What we need is a very strong authoritarian kind of state in China. He's reacting, in other words, to a, to a Chinese uh, uh, tradition. So that... But on, you, on Ukraine, just mm. to, to take you back to Ukraine, yeah. you're, you have critiques of the Mearsheimer mm. school because you think it's simplistic in some yeah. way. But I have to ask, this sense that the West has actually made it worse, mm. uh, the sense that by having such mm. extreme sanctions, mm. by withdrawing all of the sort of soft power mm. that we used to exert over Russia, have we not just fast forwarded that multipolar world, that new world order that Putin himself was dreaming of? So Maybe, but it's not clear. I mean, there's one question is, did the West in its um, behavior with, with NATO and other uh, extensions of its power under the Russian near abroad, was that a factor in Putin's uh, decision to invade? But there's a second question is when he did evade, invade, what would the West do then? Could it have stood back and done nothing? Could it have simply said, well, um, it's historically part of uh, Ukraine, it's part of Russia, let them take it. That would assume that, it's a, that the Russian policy was purely reactive, which I don't think it would have been. Would it have not, if, we, if the West had done that, um, um, uh, um, uh, exacerbated um, uh, Putin's adventurism, if you like, would have exacerbated his push? Would he not have said, well, if they're, if they're that passive, if they're that weak? Maybe he even thought that something would like that. Because remember, he, He'd witnessed um, Afghanistan. I suspect nobody knows. I don't know. Nobody probably knows. But that was a factor mm. because that was 20 years later. Nothing was achieved. A huge amount, trillions of dollars wasted. And then a sudden, humiliating, appalling. I'm not saying it was wrong by then. Maybe by then it was the correct thing to do. I actually think it was by then. Call a stop to it. But it had a big... It was a humiliation. It was a big reputational hit. It was almost not just a humiliation. It meant that the West wasn't competent. See, it's actually, there is a feature here where I am critical of the West. A lot of the people now, they say, well, trouble with, um, trouble with Putin, the trouble with um, Xi Jinping is uh, they don't, living in a culture of fear and a society that's not open, they can't recognize mistakes and correct them quickly. Well, did the West recognize mistakes in Afghanistan and correct them quickly? 20 years, 20 years of waste of life, of, of money, of um, catastrophic corruption. And it comes to an, and come, when there's a sudden um, departure, which, by the way, I don't think other powers were informed of in advance on the Afghans, certainly, or just overnight they're gone. Um, the Taliban are in power almost to their own surprise, almost hours or a few days, a few days later. I'm sure that was one of the factors that fed into Putin's... Putin's um, there was a kind of hubris... Yes. in the Afghanistan project, and maybe the same kind of hubris is visible now in the Ukraine project, where you get same groups of people mm. talking about victory at all costs or nothing short of a total victory of Ukraine will do. Well, and of course, there is a factor. it feels yeah. irresponsible. It feels more irresponsible in a way. I agree with you, Dennis, because Russia is a nuclear power. And I, one of the things that's worried me is um, recently uh, um, is that... Um, 
um, there's been a lot of loose talk, not only a misreading of Putin's motives. He said they're saying, well, he's not rational. Well, see, there's an error in the fundamental theory of rationality here. We ought if Western civilization was destroyed by an error in the theory of rationality, but uh, it's um, it would be kind of piquant, but it's not impossible, I don't think. Uh, but it's, the, the error, error is this, which is that rationality in the way, certainly in the way that um, economists think of it, um, and is um, a means end thing. It doesn't tell you about the end. It just says that whatever your ends are, you're um, tactical and calculating and you, you, weigh out, you weigh risks and uncertainties and then you do whatever you do. It seems to me that um, after the initial failure of the invasion, which I interpret as being partly to do with poor intelligence, but partly also to do with the fact that Russian, that, that uh, Putin um, is not a military man uh, uh, himself. Um, uh, he didn't understand the difficulties in the province, and maybe he'd been told by uh, he'd been given a, a false position by his own by his own intelligence. But actually, the fact that he reacted that he's reacted now by turning to this hideous strategy of kind of the Syria model and the and maybe then the Grozny model, the Chechen model of of the war. Which we're not quite there yet. I think we're going perhaps. that way. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're going that way. If you mean where whole towns are raised? Yes, and ultimately Kiev. Uh, the idea they wouldn't do it is just for the birds. Um, uh, Even though Kiev is such a mythical That's capital. what people say. I've seen some of the realists. It's sort of kind of odd in a way that they say, well, you know, these are ruthless people, but they're rational and so on. But then you say, well, why won't he level? Why won't he level the uh, Kiev? Why won't he? If it's, if, if it's necessary for him to do so, if he calculates that in order to... Why won't he do it? Well, well, because he's um, he's got these orthodox sympathies. He has got these orthodox sympathies, I think, to some extent. But would they constrain him in a while? He'd see it in some mystical terms. We've got to destroy these symbols. Creative of, destruction. Creative yes. destruction, symbols of destruction. And I'm, I'm, I think any idea that he won't um, uh, pursue um, a Syria Grozny model, if he if he has to, if he feels it, if he feels that's the way ahead. And uh, he certainly preferred to do it in a way which is deniable, which actually taking out Grozny directly, say, or taking out Kiev the way wouldn't be. So he prefer to do it by these false flag operations, by saying that, by maybe detonating or setting in motion a series of events which would result in some nu nuclear incident in one of the power stations. He preferred that because that could never be traced. So your, your view of the nuclear threat then is that it would be unlikely to be a kind of direct detonation by Russia. It well, would some more likely talk, be. Some people have said he might detonate something uh, over the uh, polar cap or something, just to, just to say, well, as a kind of pedagogic detonation, it wouldn't affect. Others have said he might um, engage in um, um, uh, tactical nukes. He's got an awful lot of them, about 10 times as many as all the Allies, including America, put together. So we've got that characteristic. And the official Russian nuclear doctrine is that using small nukes can be de-escalating. Mm. So this is not something, this is not conspiracy theory. You can click into the website and read it. Uh, they've been committed to this for a long, long time. Uh, so th these are... Um, but everything you've said... Mm points to the very urgent need to de-escalate, doesn't mm. it? Mm. So, which doesn't seem to be where Western powers That's are That's what worries me at the moment. What worries me at the moment is that they're not de-escalating, they're escalating, but they have no strategic end game. If there is a strategic end game, it's, it's um, uh, regime change in Russia. But I've kind of studied, I'm not an expert on the former Soviet Union, but I've studied Russian history and going back to the collapse of the Tsarist regime and then forward to the collapse of the communist regime. And uh, because Russia is an essentially imperial uh, structure, uh, what happened in both cases was a fragmentation of the state. Um, in, um, uh, after the uh, collapse of uh, the Tsarist system, the first to break away were Siberia uh, and the Muslim parts of, um, uh, of uh, the former Roman, Roman Empire. And then there was the civil war. And the Civil War, the Russian Civil War, there's a wonderful new book, by the way, I urge everyone interested to read it by um, Beaver, uh, the um, Brit British uh, military story, not just on the history of the uh, uh, um, um, uh, um, 
Russian, Russian, Russian civil war. Uh, it looks at all aspects of it. It's a war of extraordinary cruelty, a war of extraordinary horrors and um, 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 massacres. Uh, there were plagues, there were famines. Um, uh, millions of people perished. It's hard to work out how many actually, because many of them were kind of. Um, so, if that similar kind of disintegration did take place in a modern context, well, it almost took modern place. Arms, well, it, it almost took worse. place in in um, uh, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. But the the West was able to. There was enough of the state left intact uh, to in, to negotiate deals whereby the um, the Ukrainian nuclear weapons were taken back to Russia, which was regarded as safer, safer, and that was avoided. But the Russian state is, I think, weaker now than, than it was then. Um, paradox, it might not seem as it is, but I, I think it is because the, um, it's rotted through with corruption at all levels. Um, on the one hand, you may have this sort of quasi-mystical um, vision by Putin, but it's a kind of kleptotheocracy, if you like. It's, you have uh, uh, a mix of um, highly unstable um, um, coalitions, basically based on financial and other interests, which can lead to all kinds of conflicts and murders and strange deaths and so on. And on the other hand, you have uh, this element um, around Putin and some people in broadcasting, some of the oligarchs who've remained there or never left. Who do support this, this, this kind of nationalist vision, but the Russian state is weak. And one of the features about the present situation is that the casualty rates are highest among people from non Russian um, minorities. The non Russian minorities are the poorest, actually, there. But in many cases, they're also sitting on the mineral wealth uh, uh, and the extractive wealth for. Uh, um, for, for the country. So if the state, you see, when people say, when people imagine, which is the only thing I can attribute to the West as a strategic end game at the moment is um, a regime change and they can negotiate with, the, with, with the, then um, that would only work under certain conditions. It would only work if the Russian state didn't fragment. Um, it would only, and, uh, it, but if it does, does frag, fragment, it fragments against the background of this enormous the largest in the world, nuclear weaponry. So how would that be? Maybe people, maybe there are people, I have no idea, who thought of contingency plans about that, but it would be jolly dangerous. Mm. That's, that's for sure. Um, so if there's going to be a regime change, it would have to be actually close to the top and the Russian state would have to remain, would have to remain intact. You'd have to be some kind of hard nosed, um, um, icy cold, probably profoundly unpleasant uh, security operatives uh, at the top. But looking at things the way they are now, it doesn't seem like that. Because here, here, uh, um, uh, at the moment, two of the forces in Russia that seem to be kind of quite active um, are the Chechen leader, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, and the leader of the Wagner um, um, mercenary armies. Now, they are part of, if you like, the... Um, uh, Prigozhin, uh, that part of the uh, um, um, uh, Russian state, but they're at arm's length and they're semi-autonomous. And they're both not, are semi-critical at times. Both are critical, and they're, they're critical of uh, Russian policy, not because um, there shouldn't have been an invasion. They're critical of it as being insufficiently forceful. Uh, Kadyrov is an insufficiently ruthless. Um, Kadyrov has said, well, why not use nuclear weapons? Uh, there, that'll show them. Um, so so if, if Putin is pushed out, um, which I wouldn't rule out, I mean, it may not be as easy as many people think because he's an arch survivor and he's got layers of uh, security and so on. But uh, if he is pushed out, the idea that he would be replaced by, well, he's not going to be replaced by a, a Harvard-educated liberal economist. He's not going to be replaced by a liberal human rights lawyer. He's not going to be replaced probably by Navalny, if Navalny is still alive. It's more likely to be some um, someone from within the security apparatus. Or there could be, and I think this is the scenario which is being missed out, there could be a period of chaos. Hmm. The, and that, I think, is the is very, very dangerous. So you've got to ask yourself the question then. Um, see, I, um, I think my, uh, the, in, in, in moral terms, 
what's happened, what the Russians have done. It is barbarism. I mean, it's, 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 it's filled with the uh, echoes of um, the Second World War and of Stalinism. Uh, it is barbarism, deporting unknown numbers of children to unknown destinations. Uh, it has a genocidal aspect to it, it, it because it's basically what Putin's line is. There isn't such a thing as the Ukrainian culture or Ukrainian nation. If, if anybody thinks there is, we'll have to remove them and get rid of them. So it's, it's utter barbarism. But the kind of realism which may be relevant to this is not the shallow um, rational choice realism. It's the realism of tragedy. That's why I mentioned Morgenthau earlier on, which is that in uh, Russia, in um, 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 uh, the relations between states, in strategy, in, in history, tragic choices, choices which involve intolerable losses, actually, have to be made. After the Second World War, um, Britain entered in a, a, a military relationship and strategy with Stalinist Russia. Did we not? Um, and which was probably because they lost more, the Soviet, they lost something like 25 million, I think, in that war, 27 million. Um, uh, that was what basically um, put a stop to the Eastern, to the expansion of um, um, uh, um, Nazism. Um, if Britain hadn't originally refused to make peace, which was absolutely right not to make peace, in 1940, none of that would have happened. But in fact, the war was only actually won later on by the Russians and the Americans coming in. And in the case of the Russians, with enormous, terrible, catastrophic, cataclysmic losses of population. So what we may be facing in, in Ukraine now is a tragedy. I don't think the West can just can abandon Ukraine because, for one thing, just abandon and say, well, you sort it out, be defeated. We want our energy. Um, we're, because stopping, they're critically dependent, the, the Ukrainians, obviously, on flows of weapons. And so I don't think you can just abandon them like that. For, for one thing, the reason for that is it would be extremely unrealistic. What would be the impact of that? I mean, Putin's gamble would have come off. Hmm. Would that make him say, well, I've done what I want to do? I don't, th I don't think so. I don't think he's that un unambitious. What is that? tragic choice then. You've very persuasively outlined a kind of careful what you wish for warning to the West, mm. whereby even regime change might, yeah. might even probably lead to something worse, whether mm. it's chaos or more authoritarian leader. So in which case, better to deal with the devil you know. And how does some kind of well, compromise certain, or you can't, what, what accommodation do you think well, we should be goals recommending? Well, can't be achieved. Um, res I think restoring Crimea can't be achieved. And my reason for saying that is um, it's not just a Putinist view that says Crimea is uh, part of a historic Russia and is geopolitically and existential. It couldn't survive an existential. It wasn't just me. Gorbachev said that. By the way, Navalny has never fully, he, he's never actually said that uh, Crimea should be restored to Ukraine. He's never come out, and he said it was a, a mistake to invade it, and um, we shouldn't have done it, but he's never once, um, as far as I know, uh, joined the Western liberal view on that. And the reason is, mm. the whole of the Russian political class pretty well, the, or the, if there is such a the whole, they all regard that as critical, because geostrategically it is, giving it away they see it was a historic mistake in the 19, uh, 1950s. Uh, that would be an existential challenge to the state. So, so we stay clear of Crimea. But That's on the part other hand, the but deal, on the other hand, like... there have been moments in the, the war in Ukraine which uh, Zelensky has said there could be negotiation even on that. So the question is: Is there some is there some security um, arrangement for Ukraine? Not necessarily quite like Finland, but involving some form of guaranteed neutrality. I'm trying to press you on the logic of these yeah. conclusions because yeah. actually something like a John Gray deal is emerging from this, right. <laughs> which is allow Russia to keep Crimea mm. and uh, basically accept some situation in the eastern Donbass where That's in all tricky. reality yeah. it yeah. is a, a sort of Russian, I don't know, deal semi-controlled or, or whatever, but there would be some nominal kind of security but, but, but who would, overseas, but who would, overseen who, by who? Who would enforce it? It's not going to be the EU. It hasn't got, it hasn't got anything 
it hasn't got forces to do. Have to the Americans. The Americans are no longer interested. This we're back to the issue of the division of Europe. Poland won't ex won't won't accept. It might accept um, a full a guaranteed some kind of credible guarantee to a neutralized um, Ukraine. Um, it won't accept abandonment because that means they'll be abandoned too. So you know, and the same is true of the uh, same is true of the Baltic states. And maybe remember, even Sweden now. Um, so in a way, maybe it's not the John Gray deal so much as the observation that yeah. the current war of attrition being allowed to continue in a way suits all parties because there is no solution that it doesn't will be suit them forever. And it doesn't suit the people of Ukraine ultimately who would. Having well, it doesn't, war on their doesn't suit them forever. I mean, in the, it doesn't suit America because it's depleting their military stocks and it's very expensive for them and possibly distracts them from China. Uh, and it doesn't suit the Russians. They're running out of um, um, weaponry as well, materiel. But there's another factor now, which is that um, one of the new f features of war is um, drones and very cheap. I mean, drones don't cost millions each. They cost hundreds of dollars each, um, and they can be manufactured almost anyway. So and also they're cheap. Uh, one of the alarming features of the, um, of the, of the war so has been the, uh, Ukra the Iranian drones are coming in, because that's a spreading of the war, uh, actually, into, um, um, uh, into a larger conflict. But not a conflict with clear sides yet, because we were very paradoxical. And what's happening is the fragmentation of, war, of world order, not yet. Uh, may, maybe not for a long time, any new world order, even a horrible one, <laughs> even one dominated by autocracies. I don't think there is a John Gray deal. So there may not be a deal. Because one of the things I'm deeply convinced of is that um, the kinds of way of analyzing international affairs, which puts a list of uh, possibilities and then attaches uh, probabilities to them, is fundamentally misguided because you don't know actually what's on the list. What should be on the list? There may be, may, have, may be things on the list which are not possible. And there may be things that are quite possible that are not on the list. So we don't know. We're in a period of fragmentation. The basic, what's basically happening is fragmentation. And nothing is certain, certainly not um, Chinese hegemony, because um, the knock on effect of, um, I mean, Chinese hegemony is advancing. I just read the other day that um, the aging, Vietnamese Communist Party leaders um, having some sent greetings to uh, Xi Jinping and so on. They don't have a happy history together. They have a history of um, suspicion and conflict, actually. But, um, and uh, Vietnam has been open to various kinds of cooperation with America and Australia and other, other countries. So it mm. doesn't want to be part of the uh, Chinese bloc, but they're wavering. So all of the, all of the major powers, and even the mid-level powers and smaller powers, they're um, jockeying uh, in, a, in a way which, um, um, in a kaleidoscopic situation. And as I say, Chinese hegemony is by no means guaranteed, because they may make this, this zero COVID policy could, could actually be so crippling to the economy that they make a major mistake. So let's, let's move on to China then, for mm. a, properly. For a, I, we didn't quite get a, no. a John Gray deal out of the... Um, because there may not be because there may not be one, but the, there's definitely an impression of great peril mm. and uh, a, a situation that's going to be very hard to get out of and fragility and fragility. So the China is the other mm. big focus, mm. and you mentioned Taiwan there. And most recently, the Biden administration has done this really quite hostile act yes. to China, which is about banning, or sanctioning companies that provide certain chips or yes. prepared to do business um, with them. business with. Um, Chinese chip makers, what, how does that play out, do you think? Mm. Is that the beginning of a genuine increase in sort of overt hostilities between the US and well, China? Well, that again is, is that very, down it's very unclear because I think the background is the lack of any clear strategic thinking and also divergences of interest in, in, in the West and in America. Because on the one hand, uh, there is this Bidenite um, doctrine that... Um, as it now seems to almost be that we've got to deny China its hegemony, if that's what it wants. But then there's a question of how far we're prepared to go in doing that. Are we really prepared to go as far as war? And um, it's not clear. First of all, the Pentagon has war games, and the outcomes have not all been good. 
but also um, um, there is the... Uh, you mean America might lose? America might lose or the cost might be enormous or it might spiral into nuclear war quite quickly and so on. Um, of course, there are other things that China can do apart from invasion. I mean, the idea that it will just kind of uh, necessarily kind of... It's unlikely to repeat any of the mistakes it's seen Russia making. It could be a blockade. Certainly has the capacity to impose of Taiwan. It. Of Taiwan, yeah, strangle it in that way, or even some strange. Without the Taiwan airlift happening, if it happens, yeah, if it then happens, and uh, uh, um, or it could be some strange coup-like phenomenon in Taiwan itself um, that 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 could, that could happen. But on the American side, there is all this anti-Chinese. Um, some of it well founded given the really horrible regime that um, she has created. Um, but there's also, there are also big economic interests. Um, um, Elon Musk, Tesla, uh, there's an immense, uh, uh, Apple, an immense amount of American money uh, uh, invested in China, which is now essentially hostage. Because hmm. um, if there's war with China, that would all be lost. Who's, how are we going to have iPhones? Well, it's a good thing. Maybe we should start holding them. <laughs> I don't know. But um, um, if there is, but again, there might not be, because one entirely, to me, um, um, realistic scenario among those we can list, because there'll be others that I think uh, that happen that we haven't thought of, and perhaps even can't think of now, but could really happen. But of those we can think of now, one entirely realistic is, is, is that if a major confrontation with China is avoided for two years. Another administration comes in, DeSantis or someone, who says, well, we're not interested in all this. Um, we hate, we're hate. we not going to allow ourselves to be swamped by Chinese products. We're not going to allow Chinese spies all over the place and so on. We're going to cut down on it. We're going to knock down on all that. But we're not going to pursue. We're going to have a not an isolationist policy. It won't be isolation, but a much more um, restrained and America first, it used to be called. Yeah, inward-looking policy, if you like. I remember the, one of the things, I think, which influenced both the Chinese leadership, and, and I think this, this can be known in the case, because there are, there are thinkers close to um, um, uh, uh, Xi Jinping who analyzed America's internal cultural disorders and said um, uh, it's basically internally disintegrating. And I think the events of was it the 6th of January, January the 6th? That must have had a big impact on them. I mean, they were extraordinary events looking back at them. Uh, the Capitol Hill being stormed by um, a mob, which, which aimed to kill people. So they look at that and they say they lack the capacity, the Americans lack the capacity to, um, to really, really um, uh, act with any strategic coherence. And there may be something in that, you see, because... Um, uh, the in a way the the huge where does the huge silent power of American money where does that stand on China well it has stood um, on uh, trade opening up. opening up and trade well China's not going to open up again you see that, that in a sense that would be the technocratic thing it'll go back to the moving towards um, becoming part of the it won't do that it may want some form of globalization but the one that it dominates. But uh, are we willing, r really willing in America to write off all the investments we've, uh, the big, the, the richest, that the richest man in the United States and indeed the whole world has been involved in? We're going to write all that off because it's, it's there. They can take it whenever they want. They can, they, they can, they can vanish like they vanished Jack Ma and various other tycoons. And it looks as if, by the way, I'm, again, I'm not a not a Beijing reader or a Xi, Xi Jinping reader, but close reader, but he, he made various cryptic remarks about the distribution of wealth and curbing the accumulation of wealth, which could be interpreted. I mean, the way he's gotten rid of, the way he's extended his control, consolidated his control, and gotten rid of uh, um, threats to his power is by anti-corruption. So he could extend that, he could include... Um, uh, all political rivals. All political rivals, pretty well now. And also, um, he could clamp down on foreign firms even more than um, he, he's done. And the other side to that is, I mean, if the bottom line, you see basically in the American so-called foreign policy community, they say, well, if we, re if we retain strategic ambiguity, they think we might do something, then that will work. It won't work, not now. 
Uh, first of all, he's, she should be too committed to resolving this issue um, relatively soon. The Taiwan issue. The Taiwan issue. He's too committed. To How do you know that? It's from what he said. He kept. He keeps saying that. He said it actually. Did he not? It was the first thing he mentioned at the conference, uh, uh, the Communist Party Congress um, recently. He's not going to wait ten years. No way. Uh, this. It, so you think the Taiwan issue is going to come to a head one way or the other in the next couple few of years, years yes. two years? two or three years, either before or after a change of government. In The, the strategic question he has to ask is, is it, is it easier to do now or later? It might be easier to do if they've got a, a, a crypto isolation first America, America first regime in Washington. Because they say, well, they're not going to do anything anyway. Although in theory, it's, now is a good moment because they're occupied in Ukraine and yeah. short of arms and the rest of it. Yeah, because they... Um, how can it, we don't know who's advising and we don't know um, 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 how he works this out, but certainly I'm one, I mean, I think there have been recent comments in the United States among China watchers, but also military people who've said publicly, they've said, and I've said this for some time, actually, I've said when people talk about, oh, he'll do this in the next, it'll happen in the next 20 years, forget it. It's going to be much quicker than that. Partly because the Chinese have fallen back, uh, are falling back in in chip technologies, and they don't want to lose. I mean, they're ahead in lots of technology, as far as anybody knows. But they're not going to allow themselves to get further and further back and to be strangled in something that might seem to them analogous to the way the United States um, cut off, created an oil embargo in Japan before Japan launched its war against America. They're not going to allow a rerun of that uh, from their point of view. So uh, although none of us can say what, they'll, what they will do next, so um, you, do you think, once again, the it's American action on chips has actually fast-forwarded? It might have done. I mean, remember the other thing, though, is, which is so interesting here, is that um, um, all the evidence, there's been a sort of um, uh, dichotomy in Western opinion, they've said. The Chinese are rational, the Russians aren't rational, but the Chinese leadership is rational. So if they're rational, what do they do? Well, if what you want to do is to establish the Middle Kingdom in something like its proper place in the world, you will want Taiwan back, and you'll be prepared to pursue it at some cost or potential risk. Maybe not nuclear war, maybe uh, you don't launch an invasion which they too might lose, because it's not certain, I mean, in either side, uh, uh, what the outcome would be. That might be too risky, but they can do lots, lots and lots of, like a, like a blockade and lots and lots of, several, several, um, uh, several other things. But the key thing here is she is rational, but his goals are not liberal goals. People have assumed that rationality means adhering to liberal goals. Well, unless you, unless you have some kind of religious view on this, which God is the Logos, if you have an essentially um, secular view in which uh, human beings have goals, have passions, have desires, have um, 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 uh, objectives, then there's no reason to assume. Here, by the way, I'm just finishing a book I've been writing on Hobbes, and one of the, not on Hobbes, it's sort of what we can learn from a slightly non-typical um, uh, interpretation of Hobbes about the world today. What his basic error, if you like, was to assume uh, that the predominant human uh, passion was self-preservation. No evidence for that. A lot of things people are willing to give up their lives for. I mean, human beings kill others and uh, throw away their own lives for various reasons, identification with a group, uh, um, uh, uh, for the sake of um, some goal or project, R lots of communists, even though I detest communism, they gave up their lives for, even consciously knowing that this would, would happen to secure the victory of this, mm. of, this, of, this, of, of this regime. They give up their lives in order to find meaning in their lives. One of the paradoxes of the human animal, in which it is unique, is that it um, kills and uh, accepts death um, in order to make meaning in its life. Other animals don't do that because they're not aware of their uh, death is coming to them until it's at the very end. But um, uh, humans are different. And so Hobbes is completely wrong about that. And yet, um, uh, and I think the realists, the so-called realists, call, I still like that. They say, well, Putin won't, uh, he won't risk 
the destruction of Russia. Well, he did say, I can't remember the exact date, but it was, it was over 10 years ago, he did say, a world without the Russian realm is not worth living in. Was he serious or not serious? Was he just cozying up to the uh, the Russian Orthodox Church? I don't think so. He already controlled it. It was controlled, controlled under the Soviet period. It's even more controlled than the Putin. Basically, is a branch not only of the KGB. It's a, it's a, it's a branch of the state, fully, fully fledged branch of the state. Mm. Why did he say that? Did he say it because he didn't believe it, or because it's one of the motives of several motives that 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 govern him? But there's another side to it, which is um, maybe strong in in Putin, and maybe strong in uh, other radical nationalist or imperialist or. Um, semi-mystical, semi-religious forces that could also exist in Russia um, and could be released um, if Putin were toppled or uh, um, somehow removed from power or killed. Um, so my point is actually that I guess this is the my basic um, worry about the present situation and it applies both to um, going back to the UK and also to the world. In the UK, UK what's happened in the last few weeks, very quick, shows how quickly things can accelerate, is, is that there's been an attempt at a restoration of technocratic rationality. There were these dark, populist, incomprehensible, unintelligible, almost demonic forces that would work, uh, which uh, were probably pr promoted by Putin. They may have been at the margin, but I don't think that's the, the big the big explanation of them. They've been um, and they, they were then embodied in a mad experiment, which actually in its own way was rationalistic, was a form of extreme liberalism, um, trustism. I smelled it down, it's gone. It lasted a few days, a few weeks, a month or so, that's gone. So what we can now have in the, in, in, in the UK, liberal opinion says, centrist opinion, the, the, the adults in the room, the, um, uh, all the, uh, uh, the people who are horrified by the last six years, say, thank God that's over. Um, we can now have technocratic rationality. And I don't think that's possible because what the markets demand uh, from in terms of austerity in Britain is too painful, it's too large, it's too agonizing, uh, too impoverishing, combined with the energy situation, combined with the war uh, in Ukraine. It's, 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 it's too demanding to generate acquiescence or political stability in, in Britain. So the idea that um, Technocratic rationality can be established is 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 maybe the, the either in Britain or in the world as a whole is is the big illusion. So I, what I argue for is a much more, if you like, um, a sober uh, um, and even tragic realism, which is to say, this is a period of disintegration. This is a period of um, terrible choices. Um, but let's not shrink from it. I mean, the second. I mean, the Second World War. As it, the pride of the there was a global depression, a global, global crash. It was the global crash of twenty nine that probably was one of the big stimuli that made Nazism possible. Because the, I think, I mean, the German economy was improving before that. It, uh, Hitler wasn't getting very far. Um, um, but that disaster impoverished so many people that these um, dark movements were. Um, 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 energized by a market crash. Is the, is the market really now so stable? Is it even as stable as it was in 2015? I don't, I don't believe it. So, so, but does so, that mean that for smaller or medium-sized countries, yes. like the UK, because yeah. I'm going to try to draw to some kind of conclusion here, Yes. faced with a situation in Russia that is yeah. very complex and has no easy solution and probably looks like it might get worse, mm. a situation in China that you think will come to a head within even as soon as two years' time. Probably. Like Probably. Can't be known, but certainly could. What does a country like the UK or a European country do? Uh, should, I think know, we shouldn't give up. What does sober, up. tragic realism yeah, well, look like? Two things, I think. One is we should not give up the increased autonomy that we got from Brexit. Um, I mean, take back control has been ridiculed as a, uh, a slogan, but um, if we've been locked into the EU and the single market. We couldn't have even had the small, well, it might have been important in terms of lives, um, successes of the period. We'd have been locked into the um, uh, European energy policy more than we have been. We'd have been locked into the vaccine policy more than more than we have been. We have gained a degree of um, 
of autonomy, which I don't think we should give up, because we're locking ourselves into an institution which is itself weak and fragmented and failing and internally divided. What's the point of it? I don't. But the second thing, though, is, is that I think we should be more modest than we've been, because the idea that we can um, uh, uh, be a global power again, that we can um, have a significant role in any conflict that occurs with China. We can do certain things. We've got a high intelligence capability. We've got certain parts of our military uh, are still um, uh, functional and uh, useful and high levels of training. And, and so we do certain things. But the idea that we can um, um, uh, uh, become a global power again, I think, is, a, is an illusion. We should probably focus in a kind of almost gaullist way, you might say, on Europe, not by going back into the EU. I think that would be very retrograde and pointless because it's in all of the situations. But on focusing on what we could do in, in, in Europe to um, not maybe stabilize the situation, but to mitigate against the worst risks, to, to um, 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 uh, push some things forward. I mean, you might say, well, what does that mean in practice? Well, I think on energy, probably. I mean, we need a different um, uh, um, uh, agenda, a different green agenda, if you like, which is we need to push ahead with new forms of nuclear power. Because the, the transition from fossil fuels take much longer than anybody has said. What's happened, in fact, in, as a result of the German policy is greater reliance on coal. Mm. They're um, starting up coal-fired power are. stations. They are, yeah. I've seen Germans say, well, at least we're not going back to nuclear energy. Well, <laughs> coal is about 50, 100 times worse. Even in France, though, the, which I think 70% of the electricity or something like that was derived from nuclear energy, has had problems because they haven't maintained the investment. So, so nuclear, so, so there's a kind of energy resilience. Yes, energy. And high tech, high tech. There. And the key thing we should do, which again, we couldn't do within the EU, the key thing we do, we need to do in Britain is to renovate the state. I don't mean the state should um, uh, become dominant the way it is in China or that, that it should, uh, or even the way it was before Thatcherism. But the state has an essential role in backing some areas of technological innovation and also protecting people from the worst um, um, uh, excesses of um, market instability. In Britain, for example, to give you an example, um, in one thing that probably hasn't had much beneficial effect in France, but I mean, the arch centrist um, Macron has nationalized a large part of, um, I think it would be sensible in Britain to protect people, protect the population from the worst um, uh, uh, impact of fuel poverty, just to nationalize large parts of the energy industry and large parts of the utilities, like water, which has been a complete scandal, national scandal. Um, the, the way they've um, uh, discharged sewage into the... Mm. I mean, they say, well, it's very treated, very well treated. Well, so you say, well, you know, well, why not have a swim? It's very well treated. Well, it's, it's an absolute obscenity. When you say Gaullist, then, it's a sort of... It is a, a little bit like the kind of Brexit we started off yes. talking about. The, the non-liberal lever Brexit. A slightly more protective yes. state that yes. maybe does yes. take more control in terms of yeah. certain industries. And protects parts of its population that really protects. are, for the whole population, but part, especially the parts that are most feeling the brunt. But also uses the state to promote um, science and technology because, I mean, this uh, it is true if you look historically, where did, where did the great advances come from? Um, the internet came from, from the Cold War. Before that, radar came from there. I hope we don't have to go through a worse war than we're already in in the Ukraine to understand this. It would be better if the state took on the responsibility for this. And, it, and we won't get more nuclear power without strong state because the, the, the markets rightly judge it's, it's, it's too expensive, it takes too long, it'll be abandoned halfway through, our money will be wasted. So there's a sort of the resilience in this very yeah. fragile, fast-moving yes. world. The state needs to yes. step up to providing resilience for well, its your, your term resilience is a very good one because one of the things I've been um, uh, thinking about lately is that, you see, one of the absurdities of the, of the trust experiment was a dash for growth. Well, if the whole world is going into recession, how on earth can we, will we have growth? But growth of the old kind, um, I think we should be more looking at resilience and security. The watchwords should be resilience and security so that we can get through this very hard patch Mm. which is definitely coming one way or the other, without, without first of all, a needless human suffering and sorrow, but also without high levels of political instability. But 
John. Mm. And this is going to be my final challenge All before right. I release you from our studio here. In providing that mm. additional resilience and security, mm. what happens to freedom? Mm. Because a lot of the people watching, I'm pretty sure, will hear your talk about an enlarged state mm. and they will get terrible echoes of the COVID period. They will get echoes of, you know, overreach and all this sort of dystopian future where people don't have freedom to go about their, their daily lives. How can you protect people's individual freedoms? Mm while conducting this exercise or going about this project? Well, historically speaking, the um, periods of uh, flourishing uh, freedom of speech and expression, for example, uh, have been associated with um, periods of a relatively active uh, state, for example, even within my own lifetime, uh, which goes back to Howard Wilson. <laughs> um, and there was more freedom of speech and expression in, in Britain in the 60s and 70s in, in, in the um, um, uh, uh, chaos of the 70s. And, but even in the 60s when things were going well, than there is actually now. Because now it's chilled. Interestingly, the chill on freedom of expression does not come from the state. It comes from civil society. Mm. So the idea that there is some, I mean, the state, governments of either don't know what to do about it. Uh, they, they watch it with kind it comes of... comes from civil society and big business, international... And big business, business, yes, but very much so from within universities, from within uh, uh, um, um, NGOs, from within uh, um, all kinds of civil institutions, museums and all the rest. It, comes, it actually comes from within civil society. That's where it comes from. That's why the, um, so to speak, the status solution to this, which, which is... Uh, uh, well, we, uh, government should sort of lay down what people can and can't. It's complete sort of nonsense because uh, it doesn't come from government. It's not, not the government may have a role in protecting freedom of speech. It obviously does, uh, but uh, it, the uh, um, uh, the culture of censorship and cancellation is not something which has been created or imposed or designed by this. something that the state may have acceded to mm. and elements of big business may like as well, as long as it boosts their profits. So is one of the roles of your more activist state to protect freedoms against overreaching civil society or big business? That could be, that, that, could, that, that could well be, um, that, that would be could, well be, could well be part of it. I mean, so it would need that maybe the state would have to act in a way that it didn't before. Um, let's take an example. In the 50s, America suffered from McCarthyism with all of its sort of constitutional protections of freedom of speech. It didn't make any difference. It was much more um, uh, speech in certain areas, Hollywood and elsewhere, political, were much more restrictive than they were. Where did they come from? They came to Britain. No fixed rights of, of, of free speech, no nothing. It was simply a more tolerant culture in an old-fashioned liberal way. I think it still is, by the way, uh, to some extent. Um, the difference now is that the, uh, then uh, the civil institutions were imbued with an ethos of tolerance in the old sense of tolerance. They're not so much now. They're imbued with a new ethos, which is an ethos in which um, thought which is considered to be unprogressive, to be reactionary, to be uh, uh, can't be tolerated. Mm. It has to be uh, uh, um, excised or silenced. And so that is something that the state um, could do. I don't see how... What? They were more confident times, perhaps, or more coherent times. Well, if... we, also, we also inherited more from the um, earlier civilization, that uh, the liberal civilization that existed in Europe and Britain and to some extent in, in America was, I think, a, a, an offspring of the earlier Judeo-Christian civilization, which was um, um, had ideas of human fallibility, of even of original sin, which, as long as it can be detached from its morbid association with sexuality, points to a real truth, which is that humans are very fallible and um, we're all... Um, uh, stuck in uncertainty and um, self-division. I mean, that's a kind of fundamental. It's even in the before Christianity and even before Greek philosophy. It's in the Greek tragic, Greek tragic drama, drama which in a way Shakespeare reinvented. But um, so, I think. But that older civilization has almost passed away. I mean, there isn't now a liberal civilization. There are niches, important, powerful niches, 
like some magazines, the one I write for, um, New Statesman, and Unheard, there are niches of freedom. So we're not in a, a some of the right wing say, a soft totalitarian. We're still here. We'd know if we're in a regime. <laughs> I was leaving, I'd be a taxi would over, a car would pull up, and you'd never hear from me again. Or you'd find your bank account fairly frozen. You'd know if you were. It's nonsense. But it's certainly not a civilization defined by the old norms of free expression and fallibility and um, mutual toleration and goods. That has, that has ceased to exist. So the state might have some role in salvaging some of that or keeping it in existence. But the key thing, I guess, is that and there'll be people who have been otherwise sympathetic to me who might not be. I don't think it can be done, any of this can be done without a renovation of the state, state capacity, state authority. Uh, um, and, uh, and that in, in democratic countries, in Britain, like means um, a securing consent and securing public support. And in Britain, I think that does now mean changes in the electoral system. Because what we've had under uh, uh, the, the Tories is, um, especially in the last few years, we've had in the last couple of years, enormous majority producing weak, paralyzed, incoherent government. So first past the post doesn't work. Because that would then renew the kind of democratic legitimacy. It would give, would give more legitimacy to whatever emerged. And people would be less able to say now, which they say quite justifiably, they're all the same. I don't, I'm giving up. I don't know what will happen. They're all useless. It's just a, just a, a psychodrama being played out. In, in, in. If, if there was more um, um, representation for different groups, like traditional working class, manual working class people, like, people of different views, people who favor a different kind of Brexit, people who are uh, very concerned about the uh, environment and climate change, but don't support uh, um, uh, Extinction Rebellion or even the, uh, or even the, uh, or, or have doubts about um, whether a rapid shift from um, fossil fuels is really feasible, which by the way, again, Xi Jinping at this last Congress, which he, which he addressed, he said, they're not going to move. He said, we're going to have an orderly hmm. um, uh, move. Now, people will say, if we're in a climate emergency, if, if it takes too long, then um, it's all over. Well, the thing is, you can't have a radical shift um, uh, out of fossil fuels, which is not doesn't have democratic acquiescence in the countries where it happens. And also, which is never considered by these people, if really there was a sudden radical shift, what would become of Saudi Arabia and Iran? And Russia, they're not. They haven't diversified to the extent that they perhaps want to. In the case of Saudi Arabia, they, they, they'd be impoverished overnight. What would come out of that? More would, chaos. Much more chaos. Would they become greens? Would they become left-wing greens? Would they become um, uh, 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 close students of um, um, uh, of um, uh, green thought? I doubt it. Mm. Uh, you would have. Um, Chaotic, a chaotic uh, breakdown in state, state failures all over the place, and religio come resource wars, a, a, the darkest uh, um, uh, potion mixed from um, uh, um, geopolitical conflict, energy, uh, economic collapse, and um, religious conflicts between uh, different groups. That's what that's what would in fact happen. So, so it's not. So I think a kind of almost. It's not a very popular, and I don't expect it to be taken widely up, um, but a, a, an almost um, a tragic realism, historical realism, to say that the choice now, let me put it like this in a slightly more positive way. The, uh, we must apply something like Occam's razor to tragedy. Occam's razor was you shouldn't multiply entities beyond necessity. You should get down to what's the bare minimum. It's the same with tragedy. Tragedies happen. You shouldn't multiply them. Can't, can't get rid of them. You can't get to a world when there aren't any, because they go with being human. But you can, perhaps, uh, um, minimize them. You can get down to the tragedies, uh, the tragic choices where what's lost is still terrible, it's still tragic. I don't find that, by the way, in people who, some of the liberals, and liberal Democrats and others who say, well, you know, what's going on in China is rather bad, you know, but it isn't really. Well, it is that bad. Millions of people, it was terrible what they did in Chile. It was intimate, it was absolutely catastrophic. I think even the UN said that about 20% of the population died 
in when they originally the Chinese tried to impose some new system of agriculture it didn't work. And what they've done since then, the tragedies are absolutely real, and I strongly reject that kind of realism, in which says, well, you know, there are these. It's cost benefit. It's more than cost benefit. It isn't just cost benefit. It's recognizing the the uh, intractably tragic choices that we've got, which are particularly acute now. But we should try in that respect to, um, I think, to minimize them, to apply the Occam's razor and say, well, what could we really avoid? I think we could still avoid war with China. But that might involve a very tragic choice, leaving um, uh, Taiwan to be absorbed. That's very tragic because um, I've been there. It's a wonderful place in many ways. Mm. Um, it's uh, um, got more of Chinese civilization than the mainland of China. Civilization. It's a democracy. It's a functioning democracy. Terrible, horrible tragedy. Hong Kong was a tragedy. People, it's not to do with colonialism. It's to do with the freedoms that existed, the rule of law that existed uh, in in Hong Kong. We had to give that up uh, when we, when we did. So this is so, not. So I'm I'm, I'm yeah. taking from this. Yeah. If not exactly a program, no, an attitude. No, an attitude. Yeah. And yeah. Your phrase "tragic realism" is a really useful one because I what you'd so. like to see is a more modest, yeah. more sober, yeah. less naively idealistic yes. in, in either direction yeah. type of government. But resolute, resolute. Once we've once we've decided on what we do, stick to it. We don't just suddenly say, "Well, we'll protect you. We'll do everything we can." Say, "Well, you know, the winters are cold." Pick your battles. Pick your battles, and and then fight them, and make sure you're not going to fight them if um, if you if if you know in advance that you can't carry on fighting them through to something which will be acceptable, which might not necessarily be victory, but it could at least be the staving off or the or the or the defeat of something very much worse, even worse, even worse. So it's that that's the kind of um, I will I will I will take that. As a, <laughs> as a, or a thought to leave us with, yes. uh, Professor John Gray. So thank you so much for coming in and giving us this world tour of really quite concerning yes, um, things somewhere. going on around the yes. world. But uh, I think we we got somewhere at the end, which was towards a, a sense of where we could go next. Well, hope isn't necessarily optimism. Uh, hope can be going on because you never know what comes next. And it may be better, but basically, you you shouldn't act on um, optimistic theories, especially theories that might be illusory. But thank you, Freddie, and thank you for your very skillful, at times probing, but always thought stirring questions. John, thank you very much. Thank you. That was Professor John Gray, one of the world's most eminent philosophers, kindly taking the time to guide us through where he thinks we are. He drew some sharp distinctions there with John Mearsheimer's brand of realism and offered something new, tragic realism, in which we can't seek to set off every tragedy, but should merely try to mitigate them and avoid unnecessary disasters. Thanks to him and thanks to you for tuning in. This was Unheard.